This is a machine that will keep a ball moving forever. This is a clock that uses marbles to tell time. And this is a robot that plays hockey with itself. Today, we're not only going to count down 10 incredibly satisfying ball machines that I built, but we're also going to show the mechanisms behind how they work and some of the design processes used to bring them to life. Starting off at number nine, I rediscovered this 3D print, which is a free to download model by Yosuke Ikeda. When you pop a ball into it and lift and drop the outer ring like this, the ball moves around the ring. There are also two other configurations that are equally mesmerizing and placing marbles into them in different patterns yields completely different results. But what if we wanna make this work automatically? And to raise the stakes, what if we want 16 of these to move at the exact same time? Well, for that, I glued 16 outer rings to this sheet and 16 inner segments to this sheet along with some stepper motors and these cam attachments. The sheet with the ring slides perfectly onto the rods coming out of the bottom sheet. As the stepper motors rotate, the top sheet moves up and down. Now, when I drop a marble into each one and run the motors, now this is satisfying. But we can make it even more satisfying by adding a couple more marbles to each loop. Now we're talking. And what happens if we crank the speed way up? Okay, yeah, maybe that was a little too much speed, but we are just getting started. And the next mesmerizing machine takes the concept of the rotating balls to the next level. Number eight on the countdown was inspired by this satisfying animation created by Gareth was here. And I wanted to see if it was possible to make this happen with real life physics. In the animation, Gareth used the crank and slider to move the track segments up and down, which would work in real life. But for fun, I was thinking it would be cool to use a scotch yoke instead. In order to have the motor centered in the design, a larger bevel gear is connected to the motor shaft, which meshes with these smaller bevel gears oriented at 90 degrees. The Scotch yoke wheels are mounted directly onto the smaller bevel gears. You can see that as the Scotch yoke wheel turns in the slot, it presses against the slot, creating this linear oscillating motion. The track segments are connected through these steel posts to the slot portion, with each side aligned exactly opposite from one another. As the motor turns, the end of one track meets the start of the next track just in time. When you place a ball on top and everything is timed just right, the ball will roll around the loop perpetually. But to make this machine even more satisfying, I decided to make another version with four track segments and four scotch yokes all oriented 90 degrees out of phase from one another. Now, when you turn on the motor, you get more of a wave-like cascading motion. Not exactly sure which one is more mesmerizing. Now that's just the first two of our countdown to number one. But number seven is where things start to get a little bit more interesting. The design process for these projects normally goes about the same way. I come up with an idea based on some combination of different inputs. For example, for this project, I was literally bouncing a ball off a steel plate back and forth. I was bored and I started thinking about how I could get this thing to actually turn into a real working machine. That's normally when I get out the iPad and start sketching, trying to get a better idea for how this thing is actually gonna look. And then I take all of that and try to bring it into a 3D model on the computer. The software that I use to do the 3D modeling is called Dassault System SolidWorks. It's the same piece of software that I've been using since I started engineering 15 years ago. And it is by far the most important tool I have in the entire shop, which is why it is perfect that they are the sponsor for this video. I'm excited to introduce to you SolidWorks for Makers, which is a full functionality 3D CAD package that is only $48 per year or $15 per month. If I had this when I started engineering, who knows where I'd be? The moon. It's the perfect option for all the makers, DIYers, hobbyists out there who are making less than $2,000 USD per year off of their creations. So there's two different options to choose from. The first is SolidWorks Cloud Apps for Makers, which is a set of browser-based 3D CAD apps that run on Chromebooks, tablets, PCs, and yes, even Mac computers. Crazy. 
There's no installation required because it is browser-based and you get cloud storage with all of those apps. The second option is 3D Experience SolidWorks for Makers, which is a locally installed CAD package that gives you a lot of the same functionality as the professional SolidWorks that I use. It does require a PC, but you do get local storage as well as cloud storage. One thing I really love about SolidWorks is the ability that you get to create these massive, fully mechanical, moving assemblies. This gives you an opportunity to test how things work before you actually have to go and build them and you can even see things like how gears mesh, how slots might behave. You can even test out how a cam profile will end up giving you a certain motion once you put everything together. Literally none of the stuff that I make here at Engine Easy would be possible without SolidWorks. And if you're interested in getting into CAD or trying a different software, the amount of stuff that is included in the SolidWorks for Makers package is amazing. If you wanna check it out, learn more, or get 20% off, check out the link in the description below. And let's see if I can put my money where my mouth is and see if this thing is actually gonna work. As you can see, I decided to use the oscillating motion of the Scotch yoke to move the catchers up and down. But in order to repeatedly get the ball to bounce between the two catchers, I first need to know the coefficient of bounce between the steel ball and plate. This is basically how high the ball bounces versus its original drop height. Starting from a height of about 300 millimeters, it looks like the ball is bouncing back to a height of 240 millimeters, which means the coefficient of bounce is about 0.8. This means I need the lower catcher to be at least 60 millimeters below the upper catcher in order to catch the ball. Adjusting the distance this bearing is from the center of the wheel allows me to account for the bounce height differential. The only way to really find out if this thing's actually gonna work though, is to just throw a ball into one of the catchers and let it run. Keeping on the theme of catching and launching balls, contraption number six uses the force of springs to launch a ball to the top of this spiral. The motor is connected through this bevel gear to this worm gear. We needed a worm gear here because it can fit a really high gear ratio into a small space. For reference, these two gear systems have the same 20 to one gear ratio. It's easy to see how much smaller and simpler the worm gear is. It's always important to note that every engineering decision has its pros and cons, and a worm gear trades efficiency and speed for a compact high torque ratio. Fortunately, in this configuration, the motor can spin much faster than we need, so the trade-offs don't affect this design. The high torque output from the worm gear is important because we're going to need a lot of torque to compress the springs. That's where this mechanism comes in. As it rotates, it grabs onto this plunger and pulls it back. When it reaches this point in the rotation, it releases the plunger all at once. This force transfer mechanism is actually more interesting than it looks at first. It uses these ball bearings to transfer the force around this curved metal pin, which strikes the ball. The ball gets launched to the top of the spiral where it's absorbed by the flexible TPU catcher and funneled back down the helix. Once it gets to the bottom and back into the launch pad, it lands right in its launch position just as it's about to get shot back up to the top again. If you've been thinking that these contraptions might make for some good clocks, well so was I, which brings us to number 5 in the countdown. Taking the helix from the last one, this is a clock that tells time with multiple marbles. The motor makes a single revolution once every minute. This rotates the crank arm, which slides this rack or linear gear, which is meshed through this gear to the lifting arm. At the bottom of the arm's motion, it hits this lever, which deposits a ball into the arm's scoop. The arm then lifts the ball back up to the top of the track and drops it onto this catcher, funneling the ball onto the top teeter-totter. The time is now 12.46, with the hours on the bottom, the 10 minutes in the middle, and the single minutes at the top. Fast forward three minutes, and the next ball drops onto the top track. But instead of making it onto the teeter-totter, it causes the whole segment to tip. While most of the balls travel down the spiral to be recycled back into the system, the ball that caused the track to tip travels down this second path to the teeter-totter below. The time is now 12.50. Fast forward nine more minutes, and once again, the next ball causes the whole top seesaw to tip. But as the ball starting the commotion falls to the 10 minute segment, it causes that one to tip. Instead of following its buddies down the spiral, it takes the secondary track down to the hours seesaw and causes that to tip as well, clearing it out. The time is now one o'clock. 
If you'd like to try making this clock yourself, the files are now available on engineeasy.com, along with the entire instruction set on how to put this thing together, as well as a full list of all the parts you're gonna need to bring this thing to life. All right, on to number four. Coming in at number four is a slightly simpler design before we bump up the complexity for the final three absolute bangers. This lifting bar is connected to the motor and as it rotates, it lifts these four balls along the inner wall of the circle. This lever is connected through this link to this trap door. As the lifter arm turns, the cam on the lifter pushes on the lever, causing the trap door to open. The lifter arm continues to rotate, holding the trap door open as it just barely tips the balls over the edge. The track design was adjusted such that the balls barely make it over the first hill, causing that moment of tension before the ball satisfyingly travels back down the track. Just as they pass through the trap door, the door is released, allowing the whole cycle to continue. And that brings us to the final three, starting with this. Building on the tension and release principle from the rolling hills, this project might look simple at first glance. Each of the peaks of these arcs are at the same height. So if I were to place this steel ball right here and let go, physics says that it shouldn't be able to make it over the next peak because there's gonna be losses of energy due to sound and friction. But the ball does make it over the next peak and then over the next one. And here's where things get weird. It makes it all the way back. So the track isn't slanted in one direction. They say the hardest thing about perpetual motion machines is figuring out how to hide the wires. And looking under the hood reveals the trick and the complicated nature of this project. These are electromagnets, which do nothing until you give them a current. Then they become a magnet. On either side of the magnet are two sensors that can sense a metal ball. As the ball rolls over the sensor, the Arduino turns the magnet on just enough to give the ball a little boost, pushing it over the next peak. I've carefully tweaked the power level and time settings for each electromagnet to keep the ball rolling indefinitely. And you can see that this will go on indefinitely until I turn the magnet off. And eventually the ball runs out of energy, which takes a few minutes and comes to rest in the middle of whichever section it's in. Coming in at number two is the most complex mechanical design in the whole countdown, taking the concept of a cam actuated system to the next level. The idea for this machine came when I was trying to test the bounce coefficient earlier in the video. I got distracted trying to get the ball to keep bouncing on the steel, so I set up some vertical tracks and dropped some balls into it, which I found very satisfying to watch. To turn this into a continuous machine, I needed a way to recycle the balls back up to the top, but this presented a couple challenges. The first is once the balls drop, they need time to stop bouncing. I could have used a microcontroller to time everything, pausing to let the ball settle, but I wanted this whole thing to be mechanical, which is why I settled on a cam driven design. A cam profile can be designed so the action happens in a very specific place on the rotation. Kind of like how the trap door stayed open on the last machine until the balls finished their loop on the trap. In this case, the cams will be in this neutral position, waiting until the balls stop bouncing. But this brings us to our second challenge, which is once they do stop bouncing, they have to empty out of the vertical tracks. I could have moved the steel block and let them fall out, but I want the steel block to be as solid as possible. So I decided to move the entire track instead. That's what this middle cam is responsible for. The cam pushes on this lever, which pulls up on this gear, which pushes the track back. When the track slides back, it drops the balls off the back of the steel block and into this lifter. To lift the balls up to the top of the track, I decided to go with this oversized scissor lift style mechanism, similar to the one that I used in the comical extending boxing glove. But instead of using a lot of short scissor links, I decided to use four really long ones. The scissor lift is activated by the outside cam, which pushes down on this lever, which triggers this lever connected to this gear, which is meshed with this gear. You can see why it would be completely impossible for me to design any of this without SOLIDWORKS. This causes each arm to rotate, pushing the lifting cart all the way up until the lift cart tilts, releasing the balls into the dropping mechanism. But Designer J's goal for this project was to have the back of the vertical tracks completely clear for when the balls dropped and bounced around. So Engineer J needed to implement a third cam, which waits for the lift cart to return back to its lower position before it hits this lever. This pushes the stopper rod forward, releasing the balls.
Finally, coming in at number one, we have this robot arm that plays with itself, play, plays ball with itself. This is number one because it requires the entire mechatronic skill set, mechanical design, electronics, and coding. Giving a robot hand-eye coordination has two big challenges. The first is tracking the ball's position. To do this, I decided to use a camera mounted above the robot's playing surface. Using a Python library called OpenCV, the position of the ball is calculated. Then this is sent to the Arduino that controls the arm. The next challenge is getting the robot arm to the right spot at the right time. This is where inverse kinematics comes in, which is math that takes the position we want the end of the arm to go to and works backwards to find the correct motor angles to get there. The arm has three degrees of freedom, which means that we need the positions of each of the three different motors to get the robot where we want it to go. To extend its reach, the arm is mounted on an 800mm slider, which adds a fourth axis of motion. When it all comes together, the result is mesmerizing and honestly a modern marvel that can't be taken for granted. The camera tracks the ball's movement, the Python script calculates its position, and the robot arm intercepts and returns the ball in an endless loop. The arm was designed using advanced software, printed using advanced machines, powered by advanced hardware, and the code was only possible for a mechanical engineer to figure out using artificial intelligence. Engineering is pretty cool. Thank you so much for watching this video. Let me know which machine was your favorite and if I got the order right. As always, plenty more projects to come, so I'll see you in the next video. That was awkward. I'm not even, I don't, I don't have anywhere to go. This basement's tiny, bye.